Praise the Lord. He will make a way for you. I said it will make a way for you. The strength of the Lord will never fail in your life. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time of developing our strength, developing our ministry, and developing the qualities of leadership that you have given us already. I pray, Lord, you lift everybody up this evening in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, if anybody happens to be in a wilderness of confusion, any problem in their lives, that is making them to almost get fed up and tired and thinking they may not be able to go on. I pray, Lord, you'll make a way for everyone. In the sea, in the storm, through the waves, anywhere your children, your servants are tonight, make a way for them that they'll pass on to the other side of victory in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that this work you have given us to do will prosper in our hands. And for all our ministers from other countries, outside Nigeria, anywhere they have come from, whatever difficulties and challenges they are facing in the ministry, make a way for everyone. Lord, we we'll pray for those of us back at home here, Lagos, Nigeria, different parts of Nigeria, I pray, Lord, we'll go from strength to strength. And your grace will never be in any of our lives. And even when we are not together like this, as a united body, we are in different, different locations wherever we find ourselves. Any problem that may confront us there, always make a way for your people. And Lord, we pray that you put testimony in every mouth. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. Please be seated. In the morning, we looked in our Bible teaching at the life and the ministry of Peter, that great apostle, one of the champions of faith that you find in the whole Bible. And we find that although there was a wrong step and although that he had missed his way, but the Lord in his goodness recalled him and restored him and revived him and put new strength, dynamite within him. And then we saw in the morning the passion, the pursuit, the perseverance, and the progress in ministry that came to him. And then we're following up on that tonight as we look at the life of the minister and the development and the way the Lord takes our hands and he leads us through. Tonight we're looking at this subject from the perspective of divine intercession and divine intervention in the minister's lives. We're looking at Luke once again, Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 31 and verse 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I want you to look at those two verses and uh, begin to see something here that Peter did not see. And that you and I might not have seen. There's going to be a fall. How do we know? Because Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. You say, but I cannot see any fall there. Looks like everything is positive. Yes, look at this. When thou art converted, you are going to go down. You are going to fail. You are going to fall. And it's going to be a surprising thing. But I can tell you now that God is going to get the best out of that terrible situation and you're going to come back when thou art converted now can you tell me lord jesus whether i will still continue the ministry of course yes because even after that you're going to have a ministry of strengthening thy brethren the lord then must have had intention he must have known what he will do that although Peter, Simon Peter, will actually fall, but he will intercede. He will intervene. And eventually, he will come back. 
this is telling us something that the calling of God in our lives is without repentance. Before the Lord called you into the ministry, he thought through. He thought about it. He planned about it. He knew everything that will happen along the way. And he took into record all the things that may happen. And yet he says, I'm going to call you all the same. And you might not know what will happen along the journey. And I know every detail of it. But you'll still come out fine positive on the other side. The plan of the Lord for each of us cannot be destroyed by Satan. He protects his choice. He protects his plan. He has chosen you. And he means good by doing that. And he's protecting that choice. And he has given you a ministry. And he's, pro he's protecting that ministry. He's protecting you, the minister. He's protecting the ministry he has given to you. Satan desires to have what does not belong to him. Do you know, Satan, that this Simon Peter does not belong to you? Yes, I know. But I want to have him. Why do you want to have him? Anything that belongs to God, if he can be used for in the hands of God, I want to seize him from God. I tried it in heaven. I wanted all the angels to be bound down to me. I wanted to get all of them. I've always been after whatever belongs to the Lord. And this Simon Peter and the foremost champion and the foremost pillar in the kingdom. I want to have him. The very fact that he belongs to Jesus makes me to desire that I want to have him. But that's stealing. Yes, I know. And you still want to do it. Yes, because his title is thief. It's a thief. And he always wants to have what he's not allowed to have. And God will not permit him to have what does not belong to him. You belong to God. God will not permit the devil to have you. Or to possess you. Or to seize you. Or to take hold of your life and keep you down forever. He will not do that. He cannot do that. Whatever he has done, how far he has gone, the Lord will take you out of his hand in Jesus' name. Because Christ intercedes. Because Christ intervenes. Because Christ instructs. Look at those words again. Satan has desired to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. What was Satan's purpose? To sift him. It means to filter. When you sift something. That is of ground some maize, some corn. Or some cassava, dry cassava. And then you put it in the sieve. And then you sift, it, you sift it so that the fine part can get somewhere. You can collect that. And the rough part that is not very useful, not very nutritious, you can collect that apart and separate the useful from the useless. And separate the precious from the worthless. And so the devil wanted to filter him, drain him, winnow him strain him out scrape him separate the precious thing in his life from the worthless he wanted to sift out the divine the supernatural the super the spiritual and leave the fleshly and the selfish and the personal and the adamic part and leave that with him he wanted to render him powerless useless and ineffective that's always what the devil plans that's always his purpose he wants to remove the treasure from you and he also wants to remove you from your treasured position and privilege but christ's intercession and intervention will always prevent the purpose of satan from being realized and thank God, Christ is on your side. And you're on the side of the Lord. Whatever happens here, between this point and that point, where the Lord is taking us to, the Lord will take care of you. Three points we're going to consider. Number one, Christ's intercession and love for his ministers. Christ's intercession and love for his ministers. Number two, Christ's intervention in the lives of his ministers. Christ's intervention in the lives of his ministers. Number three, Christ's instruction 
for a lifelong ministry. Christ's instruction for a lifelong ministry. We come back to number one, Christ's intercession and love for his ministers. As we look back again at Luke chapter 22 verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan has desired to have you. Lord, why does he think he will succeed? Simon, can I tell you a secret? Already he came from behind and he grabbed one of you and he grabbed Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot is totally in the net of Satan. And he had made up his mind that he Judas has carried out that he was going to enjoy his relationship, fellowship, interaction, and deal with the devil. And even with all my warnings that I gave him, he has still made up his mind. And the devil thinks that if he can get the treasurer, then he can get the, um, the loudspeaker or the mouthpiece of the disciples. Because you see, Judas Iscariot had a good position, a high position, a central position. And Peter also had his own central position. And the devil thought, well, if I can get this one, then I can get that one. Isn't that the same way Herod was thinking, if I could get James and I beheaded him, and the Jews are happy about that, and nothing negative is happening to me, and I've gotten rid of James, then I can get Peter. You know, Peter is always a target. And the enemies are always thinking, if we got one, then we can get him. If we got Judas, then we can get him. If we get James, then we can get him. That's why Satan thought he'll be able to have you. But Peter, I prayed for you. You're too precious for me to lose. And what I've imparted into you and imputed into you is so much that it's, it's literally impossible. It will not just be a failure on your part. It will be a mark, a stigma on me and my kingdom. If I would allow the devil to have you and have you completely, that's why you'll come back. You'll come back. And when you are converted, you will strengthen your brethren. Look at John chapter 17, Christ's intercession. Christ pay, prayed for Peter. Has he prayed for you? Is he praying for you? Ah, why did you ever get discouraged? Nobody is praying for me. Nobody remembers me. Somebody greater than those of us here is praying for you. The Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. The one that the Father never says no to. Every time Jesus prays, God always says yes. And it's now at the very right hand of the Father. And that Jesus, our Lord, our Redeemer, our High Priest is praying for you. Christ's intercession and Christ's love for his ministers. In John chapter 17 verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. This tells us he didn't only pray for Peter. He prayed for them. They that the Lord, the Father, had given unto him. And then he said in verse, in verse, in verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. The reason I'm praying for them is I have an assignment for them on earth. And I do not want you to take them out of the world. And I want you to keep them, keep them in the world, but keep them away from the evil in the world. Oh, you see how fortunate those people were that the Lord Jesus Christ directly prayed for them himself. Yes, you are fortunate and how fortunate you are in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. That's how you believed. You read John John 3, 16, that's how you believed. You read Peter, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's how you believed. You read Matthew, that's how you believed. And you read the New Testament, that's how you believed. 
all these disciples of the lord jesus christ that jesus prayed for he said i'm not praying for these alone i'm praying for the people that will believe on me through their word that means as you have read their word the inspired word of god reaching by those apostles and followers of the lord jesus christ and now you have believed the lord jesus christ prayed for you it tells us in romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8, looking at it from verse 34. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, ye rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That clears it up for every one of us. That the Lord Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of the Father and is making intercession for us. Do you understand intercession? And do you understand there are some special people having special covenant with the Lord, having special relationship with the Lord? Every time, check up, every time they made intercession for a group of people something definite always happened you remember abraham he interceded for sodom and gomorrah but in, in his own case he determined the terms and the condition and he said lord if you see 50 people there will you not spare the whole land how terrible they were and see god had no commitment to sodom and gomorrah God had no relationship with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God had no covenant, any deal with the Sodomites. And he could have destroyed them. They were pagan. They were heathens. They were licentious people. They were terrible people. Simple people. Depraved people. And yet Abraham, because of love, interceded for them. And God said, Abraham, you know what? Because of my relationship with you, if I see 50 there, I'll spare them. How about 40? That's all right. How about 30? Because you say so, that's okay. How about 20? Can I say no to you, Abraham? That's all right. How about 10? Abraham, because you said it, that's all right. And Abraham stopped. What if Abraham did not stop at 10? If he had continued, God would have said yes. That tells you the power of the people that can intercede for other people. I'm making a point for you. God, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He is greater than Abraham. And God had no relationship with the Sodomites. And yet, in the intercession of Abraham, Concerning the Sodomites, God said, yes, if I see those number of people there, I will spare them. If Jesus is greater than Abraham, if we have a better, closer, more intimate relationship with the Lord than the Sodomites, if God said yes to Abraham's intercession, obviously, the Lord is saying yes to Christ's intercession. And it's saying here that Christ at the right hand of the Father, where he is now, he maketh intercession for us. Every one of us in verse 26, it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be altered. Do you get the point here? Jesus making intercession for you and for me. And the Holy Spirit making intercession for you and for me. Ah, think about that. What did I read in the Bible now? From the words of Jesus, if two of you shall agree as touching anything that you ask here on earth, my Father will do it in heaven. Go a step further now. If two of them, Christ and the Holy Ghost, will agree on you 
making, Christ is making intercession. The Holy Ghost is making intercession. And the Holy Ghost is making his own intercession with groanings that cannot be altered. And it's in agreement with the will of God and the desire and the purpose and the plan of Christ. Christ and the Holy Ghost making intercession for you. This is wonderful. The Father will answer. I say the Father will answer. In verse 27, he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God has no reason to say no, because the intercession is according to his will. It is not the will of my Father that any of you shall be lost. The intercession is according to his will. Ask that your joy may be full. The fullness of your joy is the will of God. That therefore the intercession and the prayer is according to the will of God. And the intercession is not only for Peter. It's not only for the uh, first uh, early church uh, people. It's for all the saints. Actually, according to the title of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a high priest, this is what he does. This is what he ought to do. This is the responsibility for you and for me as our high priest. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 and verse 26, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, sometimes you've heard some people say, I wish I were here when Jesus was on earth. What do you mean? Why? Why do you think like that? Oh, because if I were here when Jesus was here on earth, I could easily have approached him, and then he could have prayed for me. And what a wonderful thing if Jesus could have prayed for me when he was here on earth. I agree what a wonderful thing that could have been. But think about this. On this side of the cross now, Christ is glorified. Christ is exalted. And Christ has power, position that he even did not manifest at the time of his humiliation. When he was on the other side of the cross and he was going to the cross, he deliberately denied himself of the prerogative of divinity. And he walked in his humanity, in the flesh. And all he did, he did as Christ, the incarnate one. That he is the God that became man and he limited himself in his earthly ministry. But now he is glorified and is now at the right hand of the Father. And he is still praying for you today. If he had prayed for you when he was on earth, that would have been great. That would have been wonderful. But now that he's exalted and glorified, and now that God the Father has given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow to the glory and the honor of the Father. It is this glorified, exalted Christ, seated on the right hand of the Father, that is praying for you, making intercession for you. What a glorious privilege we have as children of God. In verse 26, for such an high priest became us, befitted or suited us, who is holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That means then the Lord Jesus Christ is still in the ministry. He ever liveth, he ever liveth to exercise the ministry of an intercessor. He is interceding for you and for me. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Reading from verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. I will pray. I will plead, I will ask from the Father that he will give you another comforter, paraclete, supporter, somebody to go along with you, somebody that has more strength than you have, that's the Holy Ghost, and he will give you this comforter, he will come to you, he will abide with you forever, so that whatever you need at any point in time in your ministry, in your family, in your personal life, that he will give each unto you. This Holy Ghost will abide with you forever. And then he says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, 
because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He's making intercession for us then. Uh, uh, look at this. In John chapter 11, whenever he made intercession here on earth, the Father always answered, I but now that is exalted and glorified, seated on the right hand of the Father. If the Father always said, Yes, my son. Yes, I've heard. Yes, I will do it. At that time, how he bowed today. Now that he's seated in heavenly places. In John chapter 11 verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Are you following through? Think about this. No wonder he said to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. But I see that because of your self-confidence, you're going to touch the ground. You're going to fall flat on your face. And for a period, it is going to be as if you have lost the battle. It's going to be as if I've lost you. But no, when you are converted, how are you sure I will come back? How are you sure I'll be restored? How are you sure I'll get back into the ministry again? Because I prayed for you. And the Father always hears me. Father, I thank you because you have heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people we stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast heard me. And then he tells us, in um, verse 22 in verse 22 even other people knew see the confession of this dear sister here in verse 22 but i know that even now even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of god god will give it thee can i tell you one secret here martha and mary could not Pray to God, the Father, on their own. They, they just didn't believe that anything could happen. Because if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But all the same, even now, even now, I know that whatever you will ask God, God will give it to you. Why don't you sometimes say that, Lord Jesus, I should have been praying. But looks like... Um, I don't know why this weakness is there, why this sleep is getting the better part of me. I don't know why I'm not remembering all the promises I ought to remember. I don't know why the spiritual weakness has lingered so long, but I want to be strong. There's something ahead of me. There's something you have given me to do that must be done. And I should have prayed, and I want to pray, but I, I know you are praying for me. And I know that as you are there on the right hand of the Father, even now I know that whatsoever you will ask of God concerning me, about me, God will give it to you. Go with that assurance before the Lord, and know that the Lord said he will answer because of the love that he has for you. How much love did God have, did Christ have for you? Because we are talking about his intercession for you. That is based on his love for you. It tells us in First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, I'm reading verse 16. First John chapter 3. I'm reading verse 16. I just want to throw this in for you. John chapter 3, verse 16. That's God's love for the world. First John chapter 3, verse 16. That's Christ's love for the church. In First John chapter 3, verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. And he assured the disciples before he left them how much he loved them. And how much he wanted them to remain in his love. In John chapter 17, John chapter 17, reading from verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. 
and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Just underline that it will take you more than a year to understand. It will take you more than a decade to understand. It will take you more than your lifetime to understand. See, that you, the Heavenly Father, you have loved them the way as like you have loved me. How can you understand that? How can you measure that? How can you comprehend that? That the Heavenly Father has loved the disciples, has loved the followers of Christ, has loved the children of God, has loved you in particular. Think about yourself. What quality has a father seen in you? And what, what, what was prize, treasure, as the Lord found in you? That if it wasn't Jesus Christ that said this, we would almost think this is false doctrine. But this is coming from the one that said, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. This is coming from the one that is absolute truth personified. And he said, Father, let the world even know that you have sent me and that you have loved them as thou hast loved me. In verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. As you just bring together all these things we have read about Peter and about the disciples and about the saints of today, about the children of God today. And you are thinking about the intercession of Christ and the love of Christ for every one of his ministers when he said, I have prayed for thee. What an encouragement that Christ has prayed for me. And you know it says, he is abiding and living. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Look at it now. We are now in the evening. And do you know that between the morning and this time, the Lord has prayed for you already. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. And the Lord loves you so much that he's always mentioning you before the Heavenly Father. He pleads for us before the Father. When we are praying, you go on your knees and you're asking the Lord for something. And immediately, the Lord Jesus Christ supports your prayer. And he says, yes, uh, that's one of my disciples. That's my son. That's my child. That's my daughter. And then supports your prayer. When you are praying, he is pleading for you. And when you are not praying, he is advocating your cause. And by his supplications, he's shielding you from unseen dangers. While Satan desired, Jesus started the prayer. The devil had not even carried out his plan. It was just a desire in the mind, in the heart of Satan. And when Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. But I have prayed. While he was having the desire, I started the prayer. Think about that. That even uh, the Lord, the Lord's mercy outruns the devil's malice. The Lord's mercy outruns the, the devil's malice day and night. Christ, our high priest, carries our names upon his breastplate as a high priest. And he prays for us before the throne of grace, the throne of mercy, the throne of love, and the throne of power. I come to point number two. Christ's interse intervention in the lives of his ministers. We're talking about intervention now. I've spoken about intercession. Now we come to intervention. The Lord's intervention, we call it divine intervention, is manifested positively for the good, in the, for the good of the ministers in our lives. And sometimes it is manifested negatively for the good of the lives and the ministries of the ministers. You'll understand as we go on, God's preventive power, God's preventive wisdom, very often interrupts us. You're going on a way like this. And the Lord had foreseen what's ahead. It will not be for your good. Therefore, he interrupts you. 
That's intervention. Or he hinders us. You want to take a decision. Plan something. Abandon what you are doing. Go and do another thing. And the Lord hinders you. That's his intervention for your good, for your future. And sometimes he obstructs us. He restrains us. There are times he closes some doors. And there are times he redirects us. And you think this is what you do. This is the way to go. And this is the thing to plan. And the Lord says no. Stops you. Closes the door. And redirects you. That's the divine intervention. This divine intervention may stop you or may stir you up. It may hinder you or it may inspire you to action. It may restrain you or it may release you in your spirit and send you forth to do something. Or it may even send sympathizers to you. It may withdraw some sympathizers from you. It may close the door. It may open some doors of opportunity. It may control you or caution you. And it may even control your enemies and caution your enemies. All to prevent Satan from achieving his destructive purpose and to preserve God's will for our lives and for our ministries. Let me show you some examples. In uh, John chapter 21, John chapter 21, reading from verse 3, Simon Peter says unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Divine intervention. Divine intervention will not allow them to succeed in this new plan. I go a fishing. They think they are dropped. They picked up again. Well, I don't think I can be useful again in the vineyard. I don't think I can make it anymore. I've blown it. Even though I am forgiven, and that has just to save me. That has so that I will not go to hell. But as to be a mighty instrument in the hand of God, I don't think that's possible again. I go a fishing. And the Lord will not allow them to catch anything that very night. That's divine intervention. And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Divine intervention. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus says unto them, Children, have you any meat? He knew they didn't have. He wanted to get the answer from them. He wanted to set them thinking. Now that you picked up your net again, now that you come to the seaside, now that you go to the old business and you abandon the new business of the new creature that I called you to, have you any meat like in those days? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the sheep and that ye shall, and ye shall find. And he cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, says unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that, that, that it was the Lord, he got his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net to the fishes. As soon as then they were come to the land, they saw a fine, a fire of coal there, and, and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus said unto them, Bring the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. For all there, all, for all there was so, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus says unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples does ask him, who had done, knowing that it was the Lord. And then in verse 13, Jesus then comes and take a bread and give it them and the fish likewise. This now is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. You can see there the divine intervention. He came to them and then he stopped them in their way. God in his prompt necessary intervention uses quite a lot of things so that he can stop man from his own project. That will not help him in the final end. 
Will this be the first time we have divine intervention? No, not at all. Divine intervention you find uh, throughout the word of God. In fact, as we go back to the first book of the Bible in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 20, divine intervention in the lives of his ministers. In Genesis chapter 20, I'm reading to you from verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will thou also slay a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, He is my sister. She is my sister, and she, even she herself said, He is my brother. In integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, have I done this? God said unto him, In a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in integrity of thine heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore, suffered I thee not to touch her. Divine intervention. Divine intervention. Divine intervention on behalf of Abraham. Divine intervention on behalf of Sarah. Divine intervention in the life of Abimelech. That this is a chosen vessel. Sarah had been set apart to bring into the world. What will cause laughter, not only for their family, not only for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world? Because in Isaac shall all the promises be fulfilled, and in the seed of Abraham. And because of that, there was divine intervention. And that divine intervention controlled Abimelech, cautioned Abimelech, and warned Abimelech, so that Abimelech was not able to do what he had intended to do. In Genesis chapter 31, Genesis chapter 31, I'm reading from verse 22. Genesis 31, reading from verse 22. Here we are told, and it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. And he took his brethren with him, and he pursued after him seven days' journey. They overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take it, that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. It's my will for him to go back to his land. It's my will so that I can fulfill my purpose, my plan in his life. And it's not just for his life and family. It will extend to a whole nation, the nation of Israel. And then it will extend to the whole world. Don't touch that man. Don't say anything negative to that man. Divine intervention. And the Lord does that in our lives many times. Look at verse 29. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesterday, saying... Take thou heed that thou speak not to just not to Jacob, either good or bad. That's divine intervention. As we look at uh, Numbers chapter twenty-two, Numbers chapter twenty-two, you will see that uh, uh, behind you, unseen, unknown to you, the Lord prevents the enemies from hurting you. And the Lord prevents you from ruining your life, destroying your life. And there's divine intervention at work every time. In Numbers chapter 22, reading from verse 7, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lord, hear this night, and I will bring your word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the, of the earth. Come now, cost me them, peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. 
Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Divine intervention. Divine intervention. Balaam, uh, don't, don't do something like that. Don't go that direction. On the, on the part of Balaam, it was divine intervention for him. Don't strike any deal with those people. Don't go and do any job like that. That's not my appointment for you. That's not a work for you to don't get involved. And on the part of Israel, Israel knew nothing about this at this particular time. And they were just going on their way, thinking there was no trouble. And even though they didn't know about the trouble, the Lord was preventing Balaam from joining hands with Balaam to hurt them, to cause them to destroy them. And so you know that uh, the Lord, in his own good way, he has his own way of uh, preventing us from doing evil and preventing people from doing evil unto us. Uh, the word of God tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 25, divine intervention in the lives of his ministers. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, reading from verse 26. 25, verse 26. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord as withholding thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. What had happened here is that David had protected the shepherds and the sheep of uh, Nabal. And David and his men were in need. And so he sent, a, he sent to Nabal. He said, please, uh, we, we need some help here. We need some sustenance here. Can you give us this? Can you give us that? And Nabal sent back and said, there are many people that are running away from their masters nowadays. How am I going to give my, my sheep and my oxen or whatever I have to feed you? get out of my sight. And David said, what? Have we been so foolish? We have protected the property of this man. And see how this man is talking. Does it he know that I'm a warrior? And then I'm going to show him. And then eventually Abigail came. And Abigail said, David, don't you do this. Don't shed blood. Leave this in the hands of the Lord. Divine intervention. The Lord prevented David, through this woman, from doing hurt to Nabal. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, for in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me. Surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. I wouldn't have left any child, any man, any male child in his family. I would have destroyed him and his people. Look at verse 38. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. David, what do you say to this? You would have killed the man and his people. And brought guilt, condemnation, blood upon yourself. But divine intervention prevented you from doing that. And ten days after, the man died under the judgment of God. This is great. This is wonderful. That the Lord can prevent us from doing evil. And then the Lord takes care of that thing himself. What's the attitude of David when he saw that? Look at verse 39. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. That's divine intervention. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail. So you understand what we call divine intervention. As you look at Job chapter 33. In Job chapter 33, I'm looking at it from verse 14. Job 33. Looking at it from verse 14. In verse 14 here it tells us, 
For God speaketh once, yet twice, yet man perceiveth it not in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose. That's the reason for divine intervention. That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. Uh, that, that means then that God in his own wonderful way he directs the steps of the children of God in divine intervention. And this is classic. This is, this is great. Uh, the great example of this in this divine intervention you find in Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, uh, you read it from verse 3. And you see here what the Lord has done in the life of this Saul, Saul of Tarsus, that eventually became the greatest apostle of his time. In chapter 9 of the Acts of Apostles, verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he had a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's, a hard, it's hard for thee to kick against the priests. This is divine intervention. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. Divine intervention. The Lord crossed him by the way, met him by the way, changed his plan, changed his life, changed his profession, changed his purpose, changed the very direction of his life. Divine intervention. That's how he became the greatest apostle of his time and probably of all time. God then in prompt necessary intervention he may use a dream he may even use the persecutor's actions he may use an ass an unintelligent creature he might use an abigail a wise intelligent woman he might use negative circumstances he might use the failure to succeed in a certain project he might choose a word from a friend or a word from an enemy. He might choose anything, anyone to redirect our lives and to move us on to the desired destination. That's why the word of God says in Psalm 37 verse 23. Psalm 37 verse, 20, uh, verse 23. That's the 37, 23. It tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Do he fall? He shall not utterly be cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. He may fall to adversity. He may fall into some kind of confusion for a period of time. But he'll come out of it, and then he'll move on because of divine intervention in the life of the people of God. I come to point number three, Christ's instruction for a lifelong ministry. Number one, there is intercession. Number two, there is intervention. Number three, there is instruction. And you see that in that passage we started with in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Here is the instruction. Verse 32, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The Lord gave Peter, Simon Peter, instruction for a life longer ministry. And the Lord said unto Peter, he said, this will happen to you. And I'm allowing and permitting it to happen to you so that you will be able to know how you will help other people that it may happen to you as well. And when you are eventually brought back, you'll find people like yourself along the journey in your lifelong ministry. You'll find people that might be tired by the wayside. 
And before they get to the end of the journey, it appears that you don't have enough strength to carry them on. And you are being restored, and you are being refined, and you are being purged, and you are being brought back, and you are being refreshed, and you are being reestablished, so that you'll be able to strengthen your brethren after you have been restored. Look at Second Corinthians chapter one. In Second Corinthians chapter one, I'm reading from verse four. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation? that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Do you see that? He comforted us in our own tribulation. It's not just to take care of us. Yes, it's to take care of us, but that's not the end. It's not just to restore us. Yes, it's to restore us, but that's not the end. He has shown mercy for a purpose. He has comforted us for a purpose. He has preserved us for a purpose. He has recommissioned us for a purpose. He has reestablished re us for a purpose. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's the purpose. Uh, the Lord said, Peter, Simon, when, when you are converted, when you are restored, when you are brought back, strengthen the brethren in Isaiah chapter 35 and this is the ministry the Lord has given us now uh, as the Lord not comforted you and re-established you and strengthened you and revived you and refreshed you and he has given you promises that now you are standing on your two feet spiritually and you are saying praise the Lord that now strength has come back into me uh -huh. the purpose for that is strengthening the brethren you have been comforted comfort the brethren and you have been re-established go ahead and establish the brethren as well Isaiah chapter 35 verses 3 and 4 Isaiah chapter 35 verses 3 and 4 strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees that's the ministry the lord has given us now you know we're not strengthened so that we can be proud we're not strengthened so we can look down on the people that are weak you must remember yourself too wasn't there that was there not a time you were weak sorrowful dejected and you need to have enough energy, enough strength, enough ability, enough wisdom. And you are all confusion. You are a bundle of confusion. But the Lord brought you out of that confusion and of that darkness and of that conflict. And now you are on solid ground. After you have come to that solid ground, it is for a purpose that you will strengthen the weak hands and you will confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that of a fearful heart, be strong and fear not say to them that of a fearful heart what do you say to the people that are timid and fearful ah you don't have any faith why are you trembling like that why are you shaking like that i about the promises of god are you so careless are you so prayerless and you do not know what you're right why are you timid and why are you fearful is that what you tell them don't tell them that say to them of a fearful heart be strong fear not Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Have a ministry of encouragement. A ministry of comfort. A ministry of lifting up people. Will you make up your mind from tonight? That now that the Lord has restored you. Now that the Lord has refreshed you, has revived you, has re-established you, has strengthened you, has comforted you, has put some dynamite and courage and conviction in you now. Every weak person you meet, you'll be an encouragement to them. Every timid, fearful person you meet, you'll give them some spiritual injection that will bring dynamite, boldness, fearlessness into their lives. You will say to them, fear not. Be of good courage, be strong. Your God will come and He will do what He needs to do in your life. You will be an encouragement to people. You'll not put anybody down, you'll not weaken anybody, you'll not depress anybody, but you'll be lifting them up, lifting them up, lifting them up by your utterance, by your message, by your encouragement, by your counseling, 
by your advice, by your interaction, by the very influence of your life, and by what you say to their neighbors. Because, you know, what you say to their neighbors about them may filter back to them. What you say about them in private may filter back to them. And when they hear what you have said about them, when they were not there, make sure that what you are saying about them, should they hear, eventually will strengthen them, will lift them up, will bring some joy into their lives. It tells us in the word of God, in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Here we're looking at verse 28. The Lord has restored you and put you in place. It's for a purpose. You have a ministry. And the ministry is to encourage other people, teach other people, feed other people, strengthen other people, energize other people, empower them, equip them, and make them to be able to stand on their feet. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, verse 28. Now take heed, take heed therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Fellow ministers and preachers, after the Lord has helped you and dealt with you, thank God your own um, fall, backsliding, weakness, whatever, has not been publicized like that of Simon Peter. At least, yours has not been written down in black and white. And sent to all the churches of every denomination all over the world for everybody to read. And for them to read it for a hundred years, a thousand years, and two thousand years. Yours had not been publicized like that of Peter. Privately, the Lord has dealt with you. And the Lord, in confidence, has given you the promises. And there you have been restored. And now you are standing on your feet. And thank God for the fire within you now. The boldness within you now. But when you see backsliders in the church. When you see people that have been cheated by the devil. Under your ministry. Or among the workers. Or among the leadership. Do you forget how the Lord has dealt with you? How the Lord has strengthened you? How the Lord has lifted you up? Or do you, come to the, do you come to the pulpit and then talk, run them down? As if you never had any problem that the Lord had mercy on you privately and did not publicize it. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God. Feed them, the people of God. You know, there, there, there's something you hear that feeds you. There's something you hear that feeds your faith. There's something you hear that feeds your love. There's something you hear that feeds your courage. You listen to somebody, a sister or a brother, and you listen to them for a few minutes, and they have fed your faith, and they have fed your love, and they have fed your compassion, and you leave them, you leave them stronger. You leave them. You were discouraged before you came, but now they have encouraged you. Be an encourager. If they say what like that, encourage people. Be a comforter. Comfort people. Be a strengthener. Strengthen people. And be somebody that is adding value to the lives of people around you. Don't put people down. And don't stamp people under your feet. And don't belittle people. And don't think he is down. Let's walk over him. Don't walk over him. What if you were there when Peter was on the ground? Would you have walked over him if you did? The Lord will still raise him up. What if you have walked over him and then you are present there on the day of Pentecost and the Lord did not use you on that day of Pentecost is the person you walked over. The person you belittled. The person you always wanted to, you almost wanted to bury. The Lord raised up. And then, 3,000 people were converted. What would you have done? Take it to yourself. Be very careful how you deal with other people. The only thing you have to do, after the Lord has trained you and established you, and then he has refocused you, and you are now on your way, and you are in the ministry now, 
feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And then he tells us how you are to be gentle and how you are to be merciful, how you are to be considerate for the people that come across your way. In Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, here is the very action of the Lord that we ourselves are to follow, that we ourselves are to emulate. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Shall gently lead those that are with young. And uh, the Lord has raised us up as leaders, as ministers, as pastors. We need to understand the reason why the Lord is putting all this in our hand and is strengthening, strengthening us in our hearts is so that after your conversion, after your strengthening, after encouraging you, after empowering you, after equipping you, after putting you on your feet again, you'll be able to go and strengthen the brethren. And the Lord is giving you to the church as a gift. The Lord is giving you to the church as somebody that will encourage the church and somebody that will strengthen the brethren. The Lord gave Peter back to the church. And the, the Lord said, Peter, you don't belong to the devil. You don't belong to yourself either. You belong to me. And I'm offering you to the church. And I'm sending you to the church now that I've restored you to go and strengthen my people. Like in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my own heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's the reason the Lord has called you here to this Congress. That's the reason the Lord has strengthened you in this Congress and is still strengthening you. When thou art converted, when thou art restored, when thou art renewed, when thou art revived, when you are brought back to favor and you are transformed, strengthen the brethren. Comfort the brethren, instruct the brethren, encourage the brethren, edify the brethren, build up the people of God, lift up the people of God, disciple them and prepare them also for their own lifelong ministries and make them ready for Christ's return, ready for the rapture and ready for heaven. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. I pray that the prayer of Jesus for you will be effective. And our eyes will see. And even though you had been down, you'll come on the mountain top. You will not be like you were before. And if you happen to have shaken in your faith, you happen to have been timid before that lady, before that maid, and you even happen, you happen to, have, uh, to have denied the Lord. Come up today. The Lord is putting your feet on solid ground. You will never be the same again. He is restoring you and He's giving a key into your hand. That key will open new doors and you will strengthen the church. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You have a new ministry. A ministry of strengthening the church. Strengthening the people of God. The Lord has called you. The Lord has appointed you. And the Lord has put something in you. They say the Lord has put in you. It will work positively in the lives of many people. Let me hear you pray. Let heaven hear you pray. Let Jesus hear you pray. And show appreciation. Appreciation for what.